Welcome to Level Up, a professional development series offered to you by the Online Master in Strategic Communication Program here, part of the College of Communication Arts and Sciences at Michigan State University. I'm Mary Jo Bales, and I've been asked to be your host today. We are broadcasting from the studios of WKAR right here on MSU's beautiful campus in East Lansing, Michigan. The purpose of this series is to introduce you to some of the top leaders and experts in business and communication so that you can gain some insight from their experience and apply it to the work that you do every day. The format is simple. We're going to have some presentations, a bit of a conversation, a few questions, and we'll be able to ask for your questions as well. Later on, we'll actually communicate with you as members of our Zoom audience and tell you when it's time to offer your questions, but we'd love to hear from you throughout the program. We want this series to be especially meaningful to you and to provide value to you personally and professionally. To kick things off, we are very pleased to have our guest with us today, the Rocket Mortgage Chief Marketing Officer, Casey Herbis. Casey, welcome. I want to give just a tiny bit of background for Casey. He leads a marketing team of over 300 members, known as Detroit's premier in-house ad agency. This agency was recently named one of Ad Age's best places to work in 2021. Under Casey's leadership, Rocket Mortgage launched two of the highest rated Super Bowl commercials, and you're going to hear more about those shortly. Along with Rocket Mortgage, Casey oversees the marketing efforts, efforts of the Rocket family of companies, 12 successful brands. You're going to hear more about that, and I think a couple of them may surprise you. Casey joined the Rocket family in 2017 after 24 years in automotive marketing, most recently for Fiat. Casey, welcome. It's just great to have you here on campus uh, Mary Jo, today. thanks for having me, and any chance I get to... Uh, come to East Lansing and come to the College of, College of Common Arts and Sciences and see the faculty and students on campus. Uh, it's, it's an absolute pleasure, so thanks for having me. You bet, it's great to have you here. I think that we'll spend a good deal of time talking about Rocket Mortgage, the, the company's evolution. I know you're looking forward to sharing with us some behind the scenes aspects of the great Super Bowl commercials. But I'd like to start by having you give us a little background on yourself. Yeah, and so thank, thanks again for having me. And you know, my journey's been really unique and interesting. I spent, when I graduated from Michigan State back in the early 90s, um, I started working at one of Chrysler's ad agencies right out of school, and I worked on tier two dealer ad group business. Uh, so the agency was BBDO, which is one of the largest agencies in the world. And I was there for 17 years, <clears throat> really understanding retail business uh, and doing marketing and advertising for dealer groups all over the country. Um, I moved into leadership at a very young age. I think we'll talk about that later, in which you know, I really was able to you know, grow as a leader at a young age, work in a really dynamic business. And then uh, an opportunity came available when uh, the Italians and Fiat took over Chrysler Corporation uh, and became Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. I had the opportunity to move from the agency to the client side. And uh, so I was at Fiat for seven years, and that was an amazing experience. I got to launch uh, five vehicles for the Fiat brand, uh, travel the world, do Super Bowl commercials. So under, worked on retail on the agency side and worked on the brand side for Fiat. And I had a pleasure of doing that for seven years, great experiences. And then a fateful phone call almost five years ago came from downtown Detroit at, you know, what was Quicken Loans, now Rocket Mortgage, where there was a search for a chief marketing officer. And I didn't know a lot about the company. I did just by osmosis living in Detroit and watching the success of the company. Um, but as I moved down there and got to meet leadership and I saw the, the team members and the culture, I realized like, wow, this could be an amazing opportunity for myself. And I was blessed enough to join the company over four and a half years ago as a chief marketing officer, uh, what is now Rocket Mortgage. So it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey. You know, agency, client, where we're solely dependent on agencies when I was at Chrysler or uh, FCA. And then now here at Rocket Mortgage, it's an in-house agency, as you mentioned. So it's a, a perfect blend and hybrid of like running an agency, but also serving as the client for our many brands within our fintech portfolio. Outstanding. Well, in a couple of your examples, Casey, you talked about a opportunity that wasn't expected and how that drove your career. Any reflections on a couple of those moments that might be of interest to our viewers? Yeah, you know, as you grow later in your career, you sometimes look back and go, um, what ifs? 
What if I didn't pick up that phone call? What if I didn't take that meeting? Um, but on the flip side, I'm always a big, firm believer of everything happens in life for a reason. Um, you know, a move I could, I may have made in 1995 wouldn't have led to where I am today. Um, so, I, you know, there's an old Sparky, remember Sparky Anderson, the Tigers manager? Um, not a very smart guy, but he was a, you know, he always had great quotes. And one of his quotes that I always use is like, I don't believe in the past because there ain't no future in it. And so I'm all about like looking forward. I can't control the past. What I control is the now. What I have the ability to control is the now. But certainly, how am, how am I setting myself up, my team, my family, you know, for the future? And so a lot of it is just more looking ahead than looking back and asking, "What if?" Outstanding. Thank you. I'd like to turn now to your company career and talk a little bit about the 20 years of business and the significant growth that uh, Quicken Loans and Rocket Mortgage has experienced. So can you share a bit of that with us today? Yeah, so uh, as, as folks may know, our, you know, our chairman and founder, uh, Dan Gilbert, proud Michigan State graduate, uh, started the company over 35 years ago, um, right out of school as a small little mortgage broker, and it certainly has grown to where we are today. And so, you know, over the course of 35 years, of course, uh, Rock Financial that turned to Quicken Loans and now the Rock uh, Rock Family Companies and Rocket Companies, it is now comprised of over 100 companies within the portfolio. FinTech, Entertainment, a lot of people know Quicken Loans, they know the Cleveland Cavaliers. Anybody under the age of uh, 30 knows StockX, right? Uh, buying shoes, that's where I get mine uh, on a regular basis, the Cleveland Cavaliers. But we also own a lot of other companies that you know may maybe people didn't realize we own, like 100 Thieves, an a esports team, uh, Shinola, uh, Zenith, which is a football helmet manufacturer. So it's really interesting that here within the portfolio of companies, we've got FinTech, but we also have a number of other uh, industries that we're a part of, and that's super exciting as a marketer because yes, I, work, I spent about 80% of my day on Rocket Mortgage, but there's all these other fintech brands even outside of the, you know, my core fintech brands that I'm able to work on. So it really helps as a marketer to flex and use different muscles along the way. I saw your helmets on your LinkedIn yeah. and, and I thought that was interesting. Uh, I hadn't really uh, thought much about that. So anything else as you think about Rocket Mortgage and the pivot points that would be important for us to understand? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for asking. And um, absolutely, I mean, as the company has grown and as I joined four and a half years ago, you know, we're an in-house agency. So we had about 100, 130 team members at the time, primarily working on Rocket Mortgage. And I realized there was all these other fintech brands where there was marketers within those companies or brands and they were maybe you know utilizing us or tapping into the in-house agency. And so now, fast forward four and a half years later, Mary Jo, like now we're an in-house agency. We're servicing over 14 brands, fintech brands like Rocket, you know, Rocket Homes, Rocket Loans, uh, our B2B side on our broker business. And as an agency, you know, I mentioned 330 team members, and we're a big shop. Um, you know, we love bringing in young talent. 35% of our team has been growth has been come from internships. We hire a lot of proud Spartans. Uh, we have a really robust internship program, uh, but we're a large shop. I mean, we'll punch out over 25,000 assets, 1400 videos. I mean, it's, uh, it's a large, large agency supporting 14 brands and we've grown, uh, we've, you know, we've almost tripled in size over the last four years supporting not only Rocket Mortgage, but the other Rocket brands that are maybe at a little earlier stage of growth and maybe in more in the B2B channel. So it's a great opportunity. One is to utilize what we've known for Rocket Mortgage there, but also from a team member standpoint, being able to work across different verticals, if you will, B2C, B2B, maybe some, uh, you know, some other direct-to-consumer opportunities. So it's been really exciting to see the growth. And, you know, and Dan Gilbert will always tell you, is like, you know, we're just getting started. Outstanding. I um, was thinking a little bit when we were talking earlier about the mindset of innovation, of, of invention, of creativity, and certainly the stories you've shared about your company, uh, that's clearly a way of thinking, going back to the you know, actually the, the very beginning. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that mindset of entrepreneurship or of creating something where it didn't exist previously. Yeah, and Mary Jo, it goes back to the very beginning of the organization. Uh, when Dan formed the company 35 plus years ago, very early on, he realized, like, as I want to grow this business, it's important to start in building a culture from the very beginning. And he developed what, you know, it really defines our core values and who we are as isms. They're very simple. There's 20 of them. I'll talk about a couple of them today. Um, but that, a lot of that is drives the mindset not in a boardroom, not inside, just inside a boardroom, not just at a, you know, a desk or an office. 
it, it works inside and outside our organization. And so it's really built that mindset of, you know, here we are, a 35 year old organization. In some ways, we're still a startup. Mm -hmm. And you see that, uh, you see that or you read about it all the time where, you know, what, com what could just be a side, you know, a side, <laughs> side room conversation turns into a brand or a company thereafter. And we just have like, you know, we're obsessed with finding a better way and we'll figure it out. And I've never been anywhere else where that is the mindset and that just opens up amazing opportunities for team members, uh, team members that bring ideas forth. And there's legendary stories of, you know, uh, team members bringing an idea to Dan or, a, you know, other leadership. And he liked the idea so much. He said, well, I'm here, I'll seed money, go start it. We'll stand up a LLC or whatever it might be. And those are now prospering companies that were just born out of a, you know, a whiteboard session or brainstorming, whatever it might be. And so that's always been the mindset of the company for the last 35 years and certainly moving forward. Outstanding. Well, in your comments, I heard a couple of isms. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk just a little bit more about how that has influenced the culture of the organization? Absolutely. As I mentioned, there's 20 of them. And uh, I'd love to share one of them that really led to a pivotal moment uh, within the organization was like obsessed with finding a better way. And, you know, Dan, as he started the company, and w was Ned Rock Financial, very much traditional, right? Brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. You know, he started to ask the question, like, hey, why is the, the, ability and the, the ability and process of Americans getting a mortgage, why does it still have to be the same? So there was little things that were done in the uh, early, mid-90s of like, hey, why don't we start, you know, Dan was, used to deliver pizzas. He mm -hmm. has one of the record, I guess, for most pizzas delivered one day. He brags about it all the time. Is like, hey, why don't we literally just, you know, mortgage in a box and paperwork and versus them coming in. Why don't we go to where our consumers were? So back in the late 90s, right? Think about what was happening in the back, the late 90s and the internet. I mean, internet was, e-commerce was just starting to happen at a scale, right? And Dan started to ask the question like, wow, I see what Zappos is doing for shoes, what Amazon at the time was doing for books, music, travel. And he asked the question of like, hey, why can't we also think about how the internet can change the mortgage process? And, you know, I love sharing these stats, but, you know, this is time, this is the time back machine for you and I, but <laughs> NSYNC was huge. Everybody had that Nokia phone. Mm -hmm. Website. AOL was the largest website in the world at that time. It was getting 43 million uniques. That's pretty sizable traffic. You know, today Google gets 286 billion on a monthly, you know, monthly basis. Mm -hmm. So the internet was certainly in its, in its inf uh, early stages. And Dan launched what was Rock Financial in 1999. And the legend has it, I was not there, uh, that the first day at launch, we had 18 uh, brick and mortar uh, branches all over the country. The day Rock Financial launched, Dan walks in a room and he asks like, how's it going? And whether it was engineers or leadership, whatever it might be, he said, Dan, it's going great. We have a thousand site visits to rockfinancial.com. And he said, in that moment, he said, that's it, shut it down. And they thought the website, but what he meant was shut down. He goes, we're, we're all in. We're going all in on the internet. Leaves the room. Of course, you have lawyers like, what are we going to do with brick and mortar? And, you know, da, da, da. And Dan leaves the room and, you know, the two folks turn to each other and they realize there were 800 of the thousand clicks between them because they were testing the site. But just think about that pivotal moment, you know, in 99 going, that's it. The future the future is going to be online for the mortgage business, and that really started to born, that started to you know bear the fruit of you know how to uh, obsess with finding a better way and taking you know early mortgage process and finding and being connected with a company uh, on the internet. That was a huge pivotal moment. So as you think about lessons learned from those pivotal moments, what comes to your mind? Um, one one is is that we'll we'll talk a little bit about this later for when it comes to leadership. But lessons learned, you know, for us, we always lean back on a few things. One is always getting feedback. Feedback from feedback comes from anywhere. I would say as the CMO, I've got twenty two thousand team members in downtown Detroit that give me feedback every single day, which is a blessing and maddening at the same time. Um, also, you know, one of our one of our isms, which we have here, is every client, every time, no exceptions, no excuses. You know, one of the things that, you know, Dan talks about and we believe within our organization, you know, love your team, love your client. 
And so a lot of companies, a lot of companies will sit up, you know, sit up on a stage and tell you, but we are just one, we are all in when it comes to being client centric. And so a lot of the lessons learned along the way is like, what is, you know, getting feedback from clients, getting feedback from team members, understanding from a user experience, like how can we get better? And we literally have, and we even have process, uh, we have process teams within an organization called Mousetrap where they can go in and it's like, hey, what's stuck? You know, why, is the, why are the pipes clogged? Or why aren't things moving enough? We literally can drop in teams that just work on process and how to, how to you know, being obsessed trying to figure out how to be better every single day and, that's, and moving at the speed of the game. So that's, uh, that, those are certainly lessons learned along the way. And you can't be obsessed with being better every day and be satisfied with the status quo. I know. We are un, uh, graciously unsatisfied at all single day. I mean, even though... You know, we're blessed enough. We announced in uh, January of 2018 uh, that we're America's largest lender. I mean, a, a big, big, you know, crowning achievement. I mean, I would hear stories of like the days of like, hey, how are we the biggest mortgage company in Detroit? Then it moved to how could we be the biggest mortgage organization in the state? And then the site was set on, you know, on the U.S. And so we're blessed enough in 2018. But it doesn't stop there. It's like, how can we continue to grow? And it's, yes, it's mortgage, but also where are the complex moments in, 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 in our lives? Mortgage is one. Home ownership, right? Home buying or selling a home. We're now in the auto business. So think about those complex moments and how could we utilize our rocket platform to help, to help make those complex moments easier and that's what's really exciting and that it's not just here we are America's largest lender and you know we, we you know of course we want to keep that title but is this all we're doing the answer is no it's where else can we expand and utilize the power of our platform our team members and innovation to help make people's lives easier during those types of com uh, during complex moments um, so you have launched two of the highest rated Super Bowl commercials in 2021. They weren't your first successes, but they were just incredibly successful. Um, your team is also involved in sports, athletics, in a number of other ways. But let's focus a little bit on the Super Bowl. Here at MSU, mm -hmm. several of our students, our faculty members do an annual Super Bowl ad party where they know, rate I, the I ads. I always ask them to rate us the best. I, mean, I, was, I need those clicks. <laughs> Yes. So obviously MSU has, has a great interest in that here in, in the Comart Sci College. So can you give us a kind of behind the scenes view of how that all evolved? Yeah, thank you. And um, you know, I've been blessed enough now to be part of six Super Bowl campaigns, uh, three at Chrysler, our FCA, and now three at Rocket Mortgage. And I always say, you know, when I have a chance to talk to folks um, doing a Super Bowl, uh, doing a Super Bowl uh, commercial is not for the faint of heart. Um, you know, they're very expensive. They're very expensive. And I was, for me, I take them very personal. I mean, if you, you know, if you were in my inner circle, you would see like, you know, the time and effort and blood, sweat and tears that go into uh, doing a Super Bowl commercial. I mean, every Super Bowl, there's only 63 brands that go into the game, right? And those are 63 companies, agencies that, you know, are just absolutely focused on the prize. And a couple of isms that I utilize when I think about Super Bowl, one is you'll see it when you believe it. I'll share a little bit about the process of what gets to that Super Bowl commercial. And then also our newest ism is the packaging is just as important as the content. And I think it's really, and so I want to take you a little bit behind the scenes to, you know, and I'll use what happened this past year mm -hmm. when it comes to our Super Bowl process. And so, you know, yep, we're an in-house agency um, and I've got 75 t creative team members on my team and 98% of what you see from uh, the Rocket brands is in-house. So if you see our NFL commercials, Ricky Fowler, Bryson, mascots, we always put Sparty in our, our commercials. Um, those, we, look, uh, we look for Sparty we, in well, your commercials. Just, that's not by accident that Sparty's in our commercials. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we, we do that in-house. But when it comes to Super Bowl, I mean, Super Bowl, by and large, for a 60-second commercial, the media, the production, the wrapping that goes around that package, right, YouTube, digital, whatever it might be, <coughs> excuse me, it's easily a $20 million plus investment. So the way I look at it as a marketer and as a CMO, like I've got to, we have to have the right idea. And I want my creative team to come up with that great idea and I want my team to win, but I've got to, I, we, like we need to leverage ourselves to make sure that we have the best idea. So 
We go to other agencies around the country, um, small, medium, and large. Um, a lot of them are through front you know, relationships I've built over the last 25 years um, or references or whatever it might be. And so when we started our Super Bowl process this past year, Mary Jo, we had 12 agencies and we started with 140 ideas. So literally the team takes a whole week and these agencies present ideas and then we go through them. And we end up going from like 140 to like 40. And we ask the agencies to rework the ideas. We ask them questions about talent or whatever it might be. And then ultimately over a couple of months, we'll get down to like six or eight ideas. And at this point, we gotta go. Like we gotta go and generally where I'm at this point, I have six to eight concepts. I feel super confident going into the game with about four of them. Two of them, there's still questions to be asked. Uh, but at this point, it's like, all right, we've got these eight concepts. And I, at this stage, I ask agencies or partners, like, develop a proof of concept. Develop a proof of concept. Does it work? Like, all we've been looking at is a flat board or we're, we're doing research. And one of the things that we always do, Mary Jo, is like when I see an idea and if there's a kernel of an idea or an organizing por portion of that commercial, we'll spend a week researching and making sure, like, I want to make sure no one else has done it. You know, hey, did Kraft do this back in the 80s? Or like, man, I feel like I saw something like this from Honda back in the 90s, whatever it might be. Because I want to make sure when we do something and we're in the Super Bowl, I want it to be first best and only. First time maybe a talent has been used. We did that last year with Jason Momoa. I want to be the I want us to be the best, to be one of the highest rated commercials. And that's really important to us. And only like I always say, like when we do an idea and we do something like for the Super Bowl, I want other brands or CMOs to go. Yep, can't do that now because they did it. I mean, that happens to me as well. And so you know, I want to show everybody. So last year through this process, we start. We looked at 140 ideas. We're down to eight. And there was an idea we were all loving. And it was the Tracy Morgan uh, certain versus better commercial. And we were all liking it for a lot of reasons. So I asked the agency to do a uh, animatic and you know, a rip, whatever it might be, like proof of concept. So I want to show you what that looked like. Mm -hmm. This is what I walked into the room with when I was presenting it to our CEO and our exec like our executive council loves marketing. They're a part of our process. I get feedback. It's not just the CMO doing it in a tunnel and then walking out and saying, here, everybody, here's what it looks like. Um, I have literally 70 people around the organization that are part of our process. So I want to show you what that looked like before we flip the lights on. Can we even afford this house? Are we pre-approved? I'm pretty sure we are. Pretty sure? With rockets, you can be certain. Not pretty sure. What's the difference? What's the difference? I'll show you the difference. I'm pretty sure they're just dolphins. I'm pretty sure that's the last of them. Everyone back in the tent. I'm pretty sure these are just extra parts. I'm pretty sure these are parachutes. I'm pretty sure you can beat up Mike Tyson. What? I'm pretty sure we can make it. Mm-hmm. Certain is better. Yeah. Let's go with certain. When it comes to home buying, pretty sure isn't sure enough. Be certain what you can afford with Rocket Mortgage and Rocket Homes. Get the right home at the right price with the right agent. Rocket can. I'm pretty sure nobody saw that. Oh, I'm certain they will. So that's kind of like that 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 right there was the moment where we, you know, we collectively agreed, all right, let's go. And then it's like now the really hard work, the, really now the hard work starts because then we, we have we had started conversations with Tracy Morgan. But the day remember, there's 63 other brands in the Super Bowl. So you have to always assume that, you know, a, you know, high A list B or, you know, the hot celeb at the time, they probably have floods of ideas. And, you know, they, now most brands now do Super Bowl. And so, yeah, we're having a conversation with Tracy. And money's, money's going to make things happen, but it's also the idea, because think about a celebrity. You know, a celebrity necessarily doesn't want to do a super commercial just for a paycheck. It's also their brand that they're putting out there. So one of the most beautiful things about our process, Mary Jo, is like we develop, like early on, we, we want to develop a trust-based relationship with the talent. And so like we started talking to Tracy. We took him the idea. He liked it. You know, and then we came to a financial terms. 
And then it was like, great, where are you? We're going to come see you. Now, down, this is during COVID, so we saw each other on Zoom. Because we're like, Tracy, like, we know our brand, but we're taking liberties of your brand even here, as you can see today. How do you bring your brand and your voice to this? And I mean, we know you're not going to mess us up. And so really, it becomes a collaborative effort. Jason Momoa is the same thing. Like, we did two sessions with Jason Momoa in his hotel room where he was filming one of his Apple TV series. Keegan-Michael Key, like, came to New York with us, sat in a room with us all day writing scripts with us. So that's part of our secret sauce is, like, developing that partnership with the talent. And along the way, it's like, it's Super Bowl. You got to go big. So we're like, hey, Tracy's big. And I always want to know, like, is Tracy still relevant to the, the Gen Zs and the young millennials? So I do, we do testing there as well, because, like, I know Tracy, because I've been watching him for 25 years. But then I was also, like, hey, where else is there opportunities to bring celebrities in that help amplify our message? So Dave Bautista, wrestler, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Joey Bosa, we have a partnership with the NFL. And then this last one here is Liza Koshy. If you saw in that rip or animatic, we used an influencer at the end. And we're like, I think it's really important to bring in, like, we'll call him a YouTube, Vine, TikToker, or whatever it might be nowadays. Like, that's an opportunity. So when my 15-year-old daughter is watching the commercial, she won't remember it for Tracy or Dave or Joey. She'll remember it because she's a big fan of Liza Koshy on YouTube or Instagram, whatever it might be. And so that's, like, that's also a little bit of our secret sauce. Like, how do we bring in, like, a hybrid of... Uh, celebrities that have a wide reach that can help us tell our brand story. So that's that this part here that's a lot of my job is like, you know, starting those relationships, developing them, getting everybody comfortable and having them bought into the process. Outstanding and and um, as you talk about relationships, Casey, which you have done several times, hearing how you were building a relationship with Tracy as you were producing something pretty substantial seems like a difference maker to me. Yeah, I mean, make no mistake. I mean, there is a financial <laughs> transaction oh, sure. that's taking mm -hmm. place. But again, Tracy's putting himself, Jason, Keegan, they're putting themselves on stage in front of 140 million people, 30, 40 million people. And we also build campaigns. We're not a one-and-done Super Bowl advertiser. Some brands are just because their budgets don't allow them to be. You know, But it's also like, hey, Tracy, we're going to be on air with this for nine months and so we're very, like, we're thoughtful in terms of, like, all right, does the, does the brand, does the spot, and does the campaign have staying power? We think it does. We want to make sure it doesn't wear out. And also, um, I'll show you a little bit of production behind the scenes here in a minute, but also, like, I'm also a big, big believer in is you have to overshoot everything, you know, because what looks good on paper or what looks going to automatic, you don't know. There's sometimes it's, it's magic that happens on set where you shoot something, you're like, oh, it's a throwaway scene. It's it's Tracy on a bull. You know, like, okay, probably won't use it, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, you get into the edit, and you're like, wow, like, there's magic in that moment, or the way the scene kind of sets up, it it offsets it along the way. Um, that's a lot of the work that goes into, you know, coming out of animatic, but sitting with the right director and the agency and the talent is like, all right, how do we shoot all this extra stuff that maybe it sits on the floor forever, Maybe it lives in the Super Bowl commercial. Oh, by the way, the world we live in nowadays, you always have to think about that second, third, fourth screen and the stain power of it. Maybe it's something we use on other screens. So um, a lot of that is also the you know building that relationship with the uh, talent to be wanting to do that. I'm sure our viewers are hearing the criteria that you use as you go through this process. Um, but one of the things that really struck me was how you're thinking about the various audiences that you want to uh, appeal to as a brand. Can you say just a tiny bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, I mean, let's be on, let's be honest with ourselves. Um, you know, from a mortgage standpoint, right? I mean, we don't have a core demo. We we have more high value audiences that we go, but our our core our core audience that we're looking to communicate with and develop that relationship with is your first time home buyers. So okay, so we could assign a demo to it, um, in which you know that is our core that is our core audience that we want to communicate with, whether it be branded advertising down to digital and social. But it's also thinking of. You know, that's why I spend a lot of time, you know, coming up and speaking to students because one is I want to get an idea of like, all right, what's next? Mm -hmm. The students today, are, it's like, you know, it's the, old, it's the old purchase funnel, right? I mean, we all know the purchase funnel from awareness down to, you know, awareness down to retention or uh, loyalty. How, you know, how can we as a brand, one is, you know, effectively communicate to a first-time home buyer. So whatever the demo you want to assign to that. 
And then, but also like, how do we make ourselves relevant to the younger consumer that may be five years away, right? I mean, it's like anything else. How do we put, how do we put rocket mortgage or the rocket brands into the mindset of a college student or a, a fresh grad? So as they're going through that process, right? I mean, we all went through it, like coming out of school, you may have loans you may have to pay. You may want to be buying your first car. And then over time, like, hey, I'm tired of running. So we want to make sure we do that. So that's also important is, you know, yes, core audience, but think of the broader audience as well. Maybe it's on the younger side and certainly even on the more mature side of someone that's out of the first home, but a second or third time home buyer, we'll take those mortgages or refis from them as well. Sounds wonderful. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see how this turned out. Uh, I would love to show you. All right. Let's yeah, do let's do it. And so um, I will tell you, I could spend another hour talking about this. This okay. was at the height of COVID. This was, and I've done hundreds of commercial shoots. This was by far the most complicated, complex, and stressful set I've ever been on. Um, we literally, four of us went from the company. We all had to drive separate cars, stay in separate places. I mean, it was at the height of COVID, but we were like, like how, we'll figure it out. And so this was an eight-day shoot all over L.A., crazy stuff. And uh, either way, let's get to the final commercial and show you how it all ended up. Can we even afford this house? I'm pretty sure we can. Pretty sure. With Rocket Mortgage, you can be certain. Not pretty sure. What's the difference? Let me show you. I'm pretty sure these aren't poisonous. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you do not run. <laughs> Pretty sure these are parachutes. Mine has a sandwich. Certain is better. Let's go with certain. Good choice. When you're buying a home, pretty sure isn't sure enough. When you need to be certain about how much home you can afford, Rocket can. So, I mean, that, that was a shorter version of it, but um, it, it, it's interesting. The one scene you saw there, going back to, like, the magic, that was the bear scene. And that was the first scene we shot. And I think we shot 12 or 14 vignette scenes. And we're seeing edit after edit after edit. And the bear scene wasn't in there. And I asked the question one day. It was late. And I'm like, where's the bear scene? And I was getting, oh, I could tell, like, the agency was in favor. The director wasn't liking it. I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I have no way to judge this until I see it. Right. And, and then it, this is where the, you know, the magic comes in a little bit. Like, then they showed the bear scene. I was like, Oh, and then we all fell back in our chairs like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. Like, so here you are. There's something that was a forgotten scene on the floor. And then it was like, as we started going and challenging like the what if, like, and with a yes before a no. And so there we are. There we have a scene like, wow, that dropped in. And it felt so great and natural. And uh, that, that was awesome. And then even nowadays, I'm sure, you know, marketing and advertising, I mean, the, the days of just shooting, you know, your TVC and going back and cutting it all up, giving it to PR or the site, what have you. Now, Mary Jo, when you come to any of our shoots, we'll have five to six cameras rolling on set at any given time. I mean, you've got the main TVC, and then, you know, let's say cut, and Tracy turns, and we're doing stills. Casey, or uh, not Casey, because you don't want me on camera. Yeah, you're Casey. Tracy, <laughs> Tracy turns another way, and we're shooting them on green screen, doing GIFs, uh, whatever it might be. And now, when you come out of our commercial shoots, that's another thing that, you know, thinking about how we continuously evolve now, when, you, when we come out of any commercial shoot, same co production cost per day. Now, we'll get three, four, five hundred unique assets. And it's not the days of just shooting for TVC and then figuring it out are different. Now, I like having like, all right, let's have a TikTok first idea while we're on set. Hey, let's frame up the shot for 16.9 for Snapchat or whatever it might be because you know, you can't just take your, your core idea and then just cut it up and then place it across, you know, different digital and social channels. I mean, a TikTok audience is going to consume, you know, uh, creative differently, right? In, in the digital social world that we live in, exactly. you have one second. You have one second to capture a viewer's attention. And you cannot, reply, you cannot rely on sound, right, unless it's enabled. You can't rely, you know, someone to read it. You have one second mm -hmm. to capture that visual attention. And so that's another thing, too. Like, I always ask, like, can I tell this story in three seconds or less? And if so, it might be a piece of worthy content. Outstanding. So I'm just thinking about was there a point when you knew this was gold or was it a process? You talked about when the magic shows up. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about how assured were you as you went through this? You know, costly. It's, it's a yeah. big investment. Yep. It's an important um effort that's underway. So I just wonder, point or process? Uh, 
I will tell you, Mary Jo, that I would say I'm, I'm probably harder on myself than I probably need to be. Uh, but I'm also going back to like obsessed with finding a better way and ungracious, ungraciously satisfied. You don't know. I mean, you don't know. You're so close to it. You have to realize I'm spending seven months of my life with this. Um, but as it gets closer, you know what I do is I walk it around and I, I like I'll go to friends, family. I'll pull interns in a room and I swear them all to secrecy, of course. And I'm like, what do you see? What do you see? What, you know, like, explain the story back to me. Did you like this? Didn't you like it? Because sometimes, again, I'm so close to it. Sometimes, you know, like Dan always talks about, you know, sometimes when you're living in the bottle, it's hard to see out. And I'm in the bottle. And so over time, like, wow. And then the moments where you start to, you know, you st it starts to crystallize for you. One, this is one, actually. Um, we run a war room. We'll have 50 people. And uh, we did it very COVID safe this year where it's like, all right, we're, you know, we're launching the website. We're launching the website. We're airing. We're following all the social. Our celebrities are tweeting, you know, different brands. We coordinate with other brands. Like, we'll go to Cadillac or Little Caesars or, hey, like, let's talk about each other on social. And, you know, like, Cadillac shows me their commercial. I show them theirs. And then we kind of strategize. I mean, that's part of the world now. Um, so you start to feel good here. Like, all right, you know, good, positive the press isn't blowing up. We didn't, you know, we, we didn't have anything in there. You know, you and I, like, you, I always think as a PR person too, like, we watch every scene and it's like, okay, who could get upset? Mm -hmm. Or did we have a blind, more importantly, blind do we have a blind bet. spot? So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is walking that spot around and I'm, I'm not kidding. Like, I'll show it to uh, certainly DEI, but government affairs. Like, I'll walk it around to our, our employee or team member resource networks too, like, don't tell me what I want to hear because I, I can't afford it and we can't afford it. So, you know, and like, are, do we have any blind spots? So this is a moment where you start to feel good. And then quite honestly, the next morning is when America votes, right? And here we were, and I'll never forget this moment, Mary Jo. Like I went to bed about two, three in the morning and I was sick to my stomach because I just didn't know. And one of my team members, proud Spartan grad, called me in tears about 6.30, quarter seven that morning. And I couldn't sleep anyways, but I was checking my phone and, and uh, she was called me and she had tears in her, you know, over the phone. And she's like, oh my God, we won. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, don't with me right now. Like, I'm emotional. And she's like, we won USA Today. Add me your number one, number two. And I was like, like a, a, just a state of like, oh my gosh, like a lot of release of energy and emotion. And because there's just so many of us that work on this. And, you know, for us, I mean, we're a fintech brand. I mean, if you go back to the uh, USA Today ad meter over the years, every year in the top 10, it's automotive, it's Pepsi or Coke, it's Budweiser, it's Google, it's Amazon. I mean, big brands that play in that. Financial companies aren't there. And uh, here we are. Haven't. Haven't. Been and we were number five last year with Jason, number one, number two this year. And, you know, we were the first brand since Budweiser in, I think, 16 years ago, we won, go number one, number two, and the first financial brand since Amex, Amex in 1989. And, you know, here we are, a little Detroit, you know, a little Detroit-based mortgage company. And, like, this is a big, like, it's wow. And it's just a testament to our agency and partners and our team members that just are obsessed. So, <laughs> and I take about two months off, and then it's like, all right, let's get going. Let's get back on the bike. Perfect. <laughs> I um, have been thinking about leadership mm -hmm. as you've been talking, Casey, because you really span the whole spectrum from someone who has to set the vision for your team, you sit at the senior table uh, and, and have input on decisions. Um, so all the way to, I had to ask about the bear scenes. Yep. So, so you're, you're spanning that whole um, spectrum. And I wanna talk just a little bit now about leadership and culture. I know culture has been very important to your company from the beginning. It's a, a key ingredient, if not essential ingredient, having the right culture in order to achieve your strategy as an organization. And leadership is a, a very big part of that. So do you have any, um, insights you want to share with us related to the, the connection between leadership and culture? Yeah, thank you. thanks for asking. And, you know, as part of my journey, and you know, I was telling you a little bit about this, we'll call it offstage. Um, you know, when I, when I first started in marketing and advertising almost 30 years ago, I started working for an agency um, that was part of the BBDO network and different name at the time. They had a CEO, another Spart, proud Spartan grad, that, I mean, I just absolutely looked up to as a decorated Vietnam officer. And I just watched here as a 21 year old in business and I had no idea. I mean, I did, I grew up in a blue collar family, never interned. And here I am in corporate world, like, you know, 
I'm six months away from removed from lifeguarding and you know working in the cafeteria on campus. By the way, students should sign up to uh, work in the cafeteria. I meant to mention that. But thank you. Here, here I am. Is uh, you know I'm watching this leader, and I and I was I was under his leadership for four or five years, and then he moved on. He retired, and you know my my career kept moving and growing and so on and so forth. And when I had the opportunity to join Quicken Loans now Rocket Mortgage, I when I walked in the doors, I'd heard about Quicken and Rocket. I'd heard about the culture. And I, I of course, I took the ISMS book, which Dan writes every year, presents it to all of our newer team members. I read the book after, during my interviewing process, and I was like, wow, like, very simple. And the ISMS and the values, like, they align to who I am as in business and personal life. And I was like, wow, is this true? And even as I joined the organization, I mean, I was a, I was a, I was a uh, product of my environment. I loved it there, make no mistake, but I was a product of my environment. So I walked in like guarded, maybe jaded, maybe questioning things. And very early on, as I saw the culture in life, it wasn't just at the C-suite. You know, too often culture is talked about in the C-suite, in the executive ranks, but it doesn't go down. Or culture is talked about at the, you know, we'll call it at towards, you know, at the more of the entry level or at the That's early right. stages of organizations. Mm -hmm. But if there isn't a foundational values that are embraced and go all the way up, I don't care. You can talk about culture all you want, you know, and, and the early stages of your career, blah, blah, blah. But if you're, if leadership, if leadership does not embody that, uh, the, the culture, does not believe in the culture, does not live it, does not teach it, it'll never work. And here we are. You know, when I joined the organization, my, one of my first meetings I walked into, you know, I heard the isms being used. I heard them, and you know, I was, again, I was going from a piece of paper to isms in action, and I was listening to how these isms were being used in a, in a you know, we'll call it a, a C-suite conversation. And then I heard and saw the isms being used in team member meetings, and I had team members giving me feedback utilizing isms. I'm like, wow, like that's strong and powerful, and it took a while. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, Mary Jo, again, mm -hmm. 28 year, 25 years out of that world moving in, it's, it's shocking, it's a lot to take in, and, uh, but thankfully, again, it aligned with who I am professionally and personally, and now I'm like, I'm, I'm in a walking ism book. Like, I've been there four and a half years, in some ways I feel like I've been there 15 or 20, but the reason I share that with you is because a lot of those isms too is all about you know, like in enabling and empowering. Enabling and empowering, and I'll give you a great example. You know, when Dan Gilbert, or Jay Farner, our CEO, another proud Spartan graduate, stands in front of 22,000 team members or they talk to new team members, they put their phone numbers on the screen. Think about that. And you know what, and, and Dan, one of my most interesting moments I've shared with Dan before, I went to go pitch him a Super Bowl idea and I thought the meeting was one-on-one. -on -one. And so I go into his office, literally a room like this, and Dan leaned back, opened the door, he says, hey, and he had always had younger team members outside his office because he always wanted to be around young thinking and innovation. And he called all these younger talent into the room. And all of a sudden I had a crowd of 50, I didn't know who anyone was. I'm like, are you, a, I, and here it was like, wow, here is a, the chairman, da, 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 and I'm pitching Super Bowl to him. And he wanted, he wanted to hear what they were saying. I was like, wow, here we are the chairman, blah, blah, helping me make a huge decision for this company and brand, and he's empowering people, team members, maybe just out of school, maybe they're still in school, I don't know. And here he is, and their input, like that's, that's, what, uh, that's what I think a lot of leadership is. Like li listening, I think, is the most important thing you can do as a leader. Um, one of the things Dan talks about, and I think about it because I am a talker, is Dan sometimes uses the phrase like, hey, I never learned anything by talking. It's a great. And uh, that, uh, to me, like listening, uh, being empathetic, um, and being able to give good feedback, because nobody gets better without feedback, but most importantly, listen to feedback. Nobody likes to give, get, get feedback that doesn't feel good, mm -hmm. but it's a matter of what do you do with it, which I think makes the big difference when it comes to leaders. You know, and, and we, have, we have a culture and environment where you should be able to have that open and honest conversation. Like, I know I can have an open on conversation with my team members, but I, I, like to, I like to think, granted, I will get the feedback, but I like to think that I don't care if you're an intern, uh, early, early into your career, or you're a 20 plus, 25 plus year veteran in the marketing communications, like I need to get feedback too, because how am I gonna get better? So that, that really is, to me, some of the most powerful things when it comes to becoming a leader, because I don't have all the answers. I've been a leader for 20 plus years, and I have a lot to learn. 
I once hired someone who answered a hypothetical question beginning with, well, I'm pretty sure I don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's exactly what I'm looking for in this role. Yeah. So that's that's a different way to think. So often top executives think they have to have all the answers. But I attended a workshop many years ago and we got a button that said, uh, none of us is as smart as all of us. And I have literally and figuratively I carried that. that button with me. I'm none a, of I'm us take is as smart you as all of us. It, please borrow away. Yeah. I didn't create it, but yeah. I have certainly carried it with me. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. I think you and I could talk for quite a bit longer, but I would like to um, engage our audience let's from Zoom. So let's take just let's a moment out, here yeah. and uh, begin the conversation with those who've been watching and listening. So I found out about the Stratcom program and I said to myself, I said, gosh, this is like what I've always wanted. And I saw a lot of cool courses, digital media, communications, um, strategic messaging. And I thought that all of those uh, programs would really enhance my comprehension of the marketing and communications field. I'm possibly looking towards making a transition out of the military and just what that's going to mean for me. This program has really made me feel more confident in my ability to make that transition. I've made a lot more professional contacts, but a lot of those people have become my friends too. And, and that's been really rewarding. Every single class I took, there was something that I applied in my day to day. I had proven myself enough to the point where I got, um, I, I actually got a promotion into the C-level. We wanted to figure out how could we make a fully online program so that people could fit it in around their work and their family lives and everything else. How could we make an online program that was awesome and that uh, would be seen as being the best? The online option really made a lot of sense for me because it kept my family intact. is flexible, it's open, it's um, very supportive. So MSU just had the overall package that I needed. I literally fell in love with the program before even being accepted into it. There are no degree programs out there that I've seen that give you more, a more diverse uh, and more robust set of skills than a degree in strategic communication. So it's the integration both of higher level thinking and solid grounding and skills that makes our program unique. No matter where my career takes me, I knew that I was going to learn so much throughout the program that, that could help me along my way. We're back and thank you. I hope you enjoyed that uh, promotional opportunity to learn more about the strategic communication uh, masters here at MSU. It is an amazing program. I have members of my team who have completed their master's degree and, and really feel like it's made a difference in their careers. But now we get to turn to questions we're hearing right. from those who are joining us virtually. Uh, so Casey, let's start with what's your, this is from Penny, yes. what's your favorite and least favorite part of the branding rebranding process and any tips or tricks for getting buy-in in a large organization? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, we, since I joined Quick and now Rocket, we've gone through several rebrands uh, over the last few years. I had never done it before. Okay, right? Like, I'm sorry, <laughs> I've never done it before. And a lot of the times it's like, wow, like we, we, we have, uh, thankfully, I've got some leadership on my team that have extensive leader, uh, experience with rebrand. We brought an amazing organization out of New York called Lippincott, which helps companies uh, rebrand. And you would be amazed how long it takes. I mean, it. Um, I've been working on rebrand for almost four years. But one of our first things we wanted to rebrand was our logo. Um, when we launched Rocket Mortgage in 2016 with the Super Bowl, a lot of colors, a rocket coming out of the top. You know, but like at the time, it was more about product first, not like, all right, let's think about the long term of like brand, brand architecture, look and feel, tone and voice. I was like, get the product out there and this comes along the way. And so as we've been looking at like our fintech offerings, all Rocket, we're like, wait, how can it all live, live and start to hang together? So... Literally, as I first got there, we started having this rebrand conversation, and it took almost two years. Two years of just, like, looking, thinking, getting ideas. I mean, boardrooms and war rooms full of, you know, whatever it might be, and it was not easy because you also think about it, like, you have an organization, you have a lot of emotion. I was not there when they, you know, Quicken and Rocket was formed, you know, but here I am leading those efforts, those rebrand efforts, so... Um, one is getting a lot of input, getting a lot of input. And, you know, and, you know one of our, our vice chairmen's got a great thing. He's like, everyone's got, a, everyone's got an opinion, but not everyone gets a vote. And uh, 
So getting a lot of opinions, ultimately, you know what it came down to? Like we, we worked on it for months and months and months. We got in a room with uh, Dan and Jay Farner, our CEO, and we had many, many, uh, you know, and we ended up landing on like the logo. Mm. And at the time, it wasn't even our like favorite. And that's okay too. Like it was maybe our third, but Dan gave us some feedback that was really insightful. And then we're like, okay, all right, I see it. Let's go. And over time, like, how does that evolve? And another big rebrand effort we just did was moving from Quicken Loans to Rocket Mortgage. It's kind of like going from Comcast to Xfinity. Like, here we are, you know, like I forever call it Comcast. And that was yet another two year, uh, another two year um, adventure for us. That was a little easier because we're just going name to name. But, you know, let's say, Mary Jo, you've been a client of ours for, you know, 15 years, second, third home, whatever it might be. And like, all right, how are we going to. It's okay for those that don't know us, but we got to make sure that Mary Jo's feeling comfortable with a rebrand because that can be emotion. Like, why am I getting this email versus this now? Wait, the logo is different. Am I paying my board? Like, and so that's you got to be very, very thoughtful. A lot of that too is when you go from a, a name change, is understanding the impact of your client, consumers, and loyalty, and understand what the trials and tribulations might be, and you try to mitigate those as much as you can, and then then you just figure it out along the way. Uh, that that sounds like great advice. And clearly, these are not simple processes. It's no. not an overnight, I'll just put something it on sound, a piece of paper. It sounds easy. It is you laborious. Yes. For sure. Well, now let's turn to Grace's question. All right. Grace says, uh, what kind of advice or insight do you have for companies that want to make an impact through their marketing, but they don't have a large budget? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Grace. Um, I'll use my Fiat one, for example. I mean, when we were launching the Fiat brand, uh, the budget that we had as the Fiat brand dwarfed. Like we would, n we would never have the budget. Here we are, a Detroit automaker, but I would never have the budget of a Ford, a Ford GM, Toyota, whatever it might be. We had budgets that were, you know, uh, you know, size right to our thing. So we started to ask ourselves: Here we are, a Fiat. We only need to sell 30, 40, 50 thousand cars, whatever it might be at the time. Like, why don't we? Why don't we stand and do something different? Be bold. And that's one of the things I've carried over to Rocket Mortgage, which we started doing things that created a lot of like buzz in the marketplace, working with, working with celebrities, doing things that, again, first, best only had never been done before. And, but along the way, you got to make sure that you're not, you're, not, you're not alienating, you're not setting yourselves up for a PR disaster. Um, even here at Rocket Mortgage, like we're fortunate, but I'm a big fan of like, all right, going first, best only. What hasn't been done before? Let's take some risks. Let's take some chances. And you don't have to do it. Yeah, Super Bowl is an easy one to talk about. But I'm just, you know, now with TikTok, for example, every day I go to Ad Age and like Little Caesars or, you know, Little Caesars is now using TikTok casting, whatever that means. Or, you know, look at what Target just did. Target just you know, created that cultural moment with a TikTok song. And, you know, granted, some people don't like it, but you're, you're able to do it. And I think it's thinking about your social media platforms and the tone and voice and where you want to go. I think there's some really simple things that you can do, particularly in the social digital space. I mean, unfortunately, there's, there's not many, very many viral buttons you can push anymore. I mean, a lot of it's paid, but you might catch that lightning in a bottle. And that's what I would always do is like, where I'm going to take the most risk or maybe in those channels where it's a little more of a finite audience and you kind of test and learn and maybe something catches fire. Test and learn. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great one. So question three, Brandon asks, in today's world, there is a constant demand for content. Yes. Uh, certainly different from when I began my career. Mm -hmm. um, how do you and your team help create content without creating that sense of burnout? Yeah, um, Rand, great question. Um, we've we've evolved. Um, one of the examples, as I shared with you, like is when we go shoot our TVC. Um, before I got there, our team would go shoot the TV commercial, and they wouldn't ask what the digital or the social or whatever else needed. Now, when we when we look at television concepts, we also have the team bring digital first ideas or social first ideas in conjunction with the organizing idea. So now, and let's say we sell in the concept and we go shoot the TV commercial, now brand, social, digital, whatever, PR, dot, whatever, they're all at the table. So when we go shoot that TVC, again, we're bringing home all that content. So yeah, there's content burnout. Now I'm not sending five crews out to shoot five different things. I got one crew out going to get all this footage. Um, the other thing too, which we did two years ago, and I would tell any company that they should really seriously look at this, is uh, we stood up our own publishing house. 
Um, you know, like search is very expensive. It's a great, uh, a, a great lead, draw, uh, lead generator, but the power of SEO cannot be underestimated. And so, yes, we're doing all the right things from an SEO standpoint, link, the link building and relevant. Now, I stood up a publishing house two years ago, and so now we're doing 300 articles a month. We're now doing a YouTube series. I just launched a podcast, like, and I've challenged the team, like, how can you do at scale one piece of content every day? And, you know, there's easier ways to do that in the, con the content world, but it's also thinking small at the same time. But standing up a publishing house here, and now that publishing house serves all the fintech brands. And so rock it off. Like, so as we want to build more and more relevancy for our dot-coms, our digital storefronts, we're building more and more relevancy with our SEO values, and the pub house certainly does it. Thank you. Heather asks, how do you balance listening, which we've talked a lot about, and inviting feedback from all levels, like you've described, with demonstrating confidence and clarity in decision making? Yeah. Um, it, it, sometimes it, 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 you can find yourself, you have to step back sometimes. It's easy just to plow ahead when there are deadlines looming or answers that need to be given. Um, but what you need, to, what I always say as a leader, and I ask this of my leaders and my team, like you got to step back and being able to balance the two. Um, you know, again, Super Bowl is a great, a great example of which, you know, by the time that commercial gets on air, I will have personally shown it to 70, 100 people. They have nothing to do with it. They have nothing to do with marketing. They maybe live, they live within the organization or I take it to friends and family that, you know, and because I need different opinions along the way. Um, and so, that the listening is very important, but again, sometimes you get lost in the process and the deadlines are looming. You you have to challenge yourself. You have to hold yourself accountable, but also your leaders. Like, you got to be able to take that listening. Now, it can also be crazy. It can drive you nuts, right? Because it's you know I came back to that example of everyone's got an opinion, but not everyone gets a vote. Like at some point too, I got to just shut her down because I could play with a, a commercial for years. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes you just gotta you know the analogy of sometimes you just gotta throw the plane up in the sky. And then maybe got tinkered along the way. Um, that's another thing our culture is. Uh, one of our isms is take the roast out of the oven. Like uh, companies are like this, and I worked at one of those like this. That roast would sit in an oven for years if you let it. Well, that's um, a really interesting point. I I'm hearing don't let perfection be the enemy of the good, and yet you have to deliver outstanding work time after time and still serve the mission of your organization, the purpose of the team that you, you bring. So time for one last quick question. Right. Uh, where do you see the most success with acquisition strategy? Is it strictly a digital focus? If so, what platforms do you see the most success with and why? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, acquisition standpoint or lead generation, I mean, our business is no different than automotive in that we're trying to drive good, high-quality leads to our bankers. And automotive, obviously, you're trying to drive a lot of traffic to dealerships. Um, so performance marketing for us, which is an in-house capability, you know, we do spend we spend a vast majority of our budget on acquisition. So there are those traditional channels, right? We spend a lot of money in SEM. Um, you know, Google will tell you we should spend fivefold, but I just can't. You know, how do you put yourselves in position with those keywords, key moments as people are searching? Again, SEO, as I mentioned, like the amount of investment that we're making now in SEO is like just skyrocketing because SEM, I can't afford all the SEM, but guess what SEO is? And as I build more and more relevancy for our brands and our message, that's going to help. There's certain other ones. And I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you where I found some really early success is in some social media platforms. Uh, when I joined the company four years ago, we flew out to Snap in, uh, you know, in Venice, and I was like, all right, why, I mean, Snapchat, yet I got it for a brand. They want to talk us, to us about Snap as a uh, lead gen. You know, skeptical, like, help me, get, you know, like, I don't get this. And we started testing. Wow, we started finding some results. And guess what now? TikTok. Hmm. And I tell brands right now, like, go test. Like, I think the, 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 the thing with, like, TikTok is, like, all right, is this going to be the next Vine that goes away? Is this going to be the next MySpace? Or is this the next Facebook, IG, Twitter, and you know, I'm betting on the more on the upside. And so let's go test and learn TikTok. Like, go do UGC Creative. Go do some things that you normally wouldn't, you know, do as a brand, but test and learn. And we're actually finding, like, a lot of good pot, good lead flow in, through acquisition on TikTok. And the cost of entry is not that bad. So, you know, if I were counseling small businesses, I would, like, really consider that as, like, a core acquisition. But don't just don't take your, you know, your website video or whatever. Like, we do UGC and like it's it's rough and raw, but it is like perfect for the TikTok audience. And 
that has emerged in such an interesting way over the past few months. It's interesting that you're kind of out in front of out in front of that. Mm -hmm. So Casey, when we talked earlier today, you mentioned how much you enjoy giving back and you certainly have been an example of that in your conversation with us today. I hope our viewers on Zoom have enjoy enjoyed this very much and I just wanna thank everybody who's been part of the production, who's helped us get to this point, those who organized and got us ready for today. But I also really wanna thank our viewers. You're why we're here and we're thankful that you joined us today. Thank you.